you looking to up your real estate investing game? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Sub 2 Deal Show with your host, Sub 2 expert, William Tingle. Hey, Sub 2ers. My name's William Tingle of Sub2Deals.com. I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the Sub 2 Deal Show, where we talk about all things subject to, and sometimes we will cover a few other different real estate related topics, but it's always something to help you build your real estate investing business. Today's topic, cold calling. Yeah, that's a fun one, isn't it? You know, I think cold calling ranks right up there with probably just public speaking as far as things that, that people fear. It, it can be kind of intimidating to, uh, to pick that phone up and call a complete stranger and, and talk to them about doing business. I mean, I, I get it. I really do. Uh, cold calling, uh, you know, the people that we call and, and know that probably a quarter of the deals that we do right now come from just picking the phone up and calling someone that's got a property for sale. You know, whether they've got that property listed on Craigslist or, or Zillow or Fisbo.com or any of the dozens of Fisbo sites for rent by owner sites, uh, all of those different websites. You know, we, we're looking for specific houses. We narrow those things down and then we pick up the phone and give them a call. And if you're like me and you're doing business remotely or you're thousands of miles away from your seller, you know, I have to close that thing on the phone. So you know, it can be kind of difficult to do. You have to develop a relationship with someone in a short period of time and, and get them to trust you and like you and want to do business with you. And, and that can be kind of tough. Now, I know there are some people out there that say, hey, if you're calling someone um, that, that has a property listed for sale, it's not really cold calling. And listen, that, that may be true. To me, if I'm calling someone that I've never met, that doesn't know me, I've never spoken to them, and I'm, I'm sort of an intrusion on their day. The call wasn't scheduled. It's kind of out of the blue. To me, that's a cold call. And, you know, whether it is or whether it isn't, um, you know, I think most of you listening probably agree that it's probably a cold call, but it really doesn't make any difference. That's really what we're talking about today. We'll let everybody else that disagrees, we'll let them worry about the semantics of the situation. So today, for our purposes today, what we're talking about is picking up the phone and calling a seller that has a property for sale. They've got it listed in either the paper or on one of the websites. And I actually got this question from one of, uh, one of the members of our coaching group. He asked me, he said, you know, when you're calling somebody, how do you really take the seller where you want them to go when you cold call? And, uh, and so you know, this is what I put together for them, and I'm going to share that with you here today. So when I call, my objective, of course, is to gather as much information as I can and get the seller, you know, as comfortable with me as possible in the shortest period of time. Now, you know, I don't have all day to talk unless we're talking terms. So in my opinion, the faster I can get down to brass tacks, the better. Now, I, I don't want to just talk all day. You know, my objective, if we're not going to be able to do business, I want to get off the phone and on to the next one. So that's really what I focus on doing. You know, I sort of let the seller, you know, self-eliminate themselves from, from doing business with me. And I'll show you kind of how that works. So if I dial the number, someone answers the phone, I ask for the owner. Now, I want to make sure that I've got the right person on the phone, so I'm going to ask for the owner by name. Uh, if I've got their name in the listing, and most of the times you, you will, or you can do just a little bit of Google searching to find the person you know, that you need who owns this property. And once I've got that name, uh, let's just say that the, the owner's name is Joe Smith. I, when they answer, and, and I'm going to ask for Joe, and just Joe, I don't ask for Joe Smith or Mr. Smith. I Remember, I want to get as familiar with the seller and it, have him be as comfortable with me as possible as quickly as possible. So um, if, if I'm looking at it on Zillow or Craigslist, and, and I'll, I'll say something to that effect, uh, but uh, once I get Joe on the phone, I'm going to ask Joe, hey, uh, 
you know, I, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at this beautiful, beautiful property of yours that you have for sale on Zillow. I can see it's four bedrooms, two baths, and it has a three-car garage. Is there anything else that you can tell me about it? So I'm going to ask him that. Now, did I already see that in the listing? Well, sure. But remember, we're trying to get these folks to talk to us, and the more they talk, the more comfortable they'll feel. So yes, I'm gathering information, but that's really only part of it. I'm also looking for hesitancy or resistance or anything less than total cooperation to give me an indication of, you know, is this seller going to be cooperative? Maybe will they be somebody that I can work with? If I hear something like, well, can't you read the ad? Or did you read the ad? What else do you want to know? If I hear that in a certain tone, then I know there's a pretty good chance that it's going to be a short call because somebody that really, really wants to get rid of a house, they generally won't handle it that way. They're open to anyone that's interested. So if they tell me more about the house, I'm going to let them talk. And I'll interject some agreeable things like, well, that sounds great or that's very nice. You know, they can't see me nodding in agreement since I'm on the phone so it's important that they get positive signals from somewhere. And since you're on the phone, verbal is really about all you can do. But once we get through that, then I'm going to ask something like, Joe, this sounds like a great house. Why in the world would you want to sell it? And then you just listen. Okay. Now, what comes after this is probably going to be where you'll find out if this seller is going to be likely to work with you or not. Now, I like to listen for things like, well, my wife and I are getting a divorce, so we have to sell a house. Or I got a job transfer, and we need to move next month. Or we're building another house, and it'll be ready in a couple of months, and we don't really want to make two house payments. You know, there are many variations on that, but those are some of the more common ones that you'll hear. And before you say, well, who in the heck's going to tell you that? Listen, you would be amazed at what people will tell you about their personal business if you just ask the questions. It happens all the time. You'll hear more than you ever want to know, okay? Now, if I hear something like, well, you know, we're just kind of testing the market because well, we're thinking about buying another house, then you can most likely just pack it up and move on because there's really not an indication of motivation in, in a phrase like that. So, so you're listening. You're paying very close attention to what your, you know, the responses that you're getting. But anyway, if the signals and reason for selling sound like there may be motivation, my next move is to find out how soon they want to get it done. So I'll come back with something like, well, Joe, I see. So if we can come to an agreement, how soon would you like to get this done? Again, now I'm looking for more sooner than later. Sooner is always better. It's always a good sign. Um, by saying something about us coming to an agreement, I'm planning the subliminal thought that we will actually come to an agreement and be able to do some business. So you're, you're doing a little bit of a, a psychological sort of thing there just by mentioning it. So Joe's told me that he needs to move for a job transfer and he would like to have this thing closed by the end of the month. So now I need to know about financing because I need to know if this is going to be a deal that I want to do or not. Now, I already know that Joe is asking $179 for the house and my knowledge of the area tells me, well, it may be a tad bit on the high side. Uh, with comps, but it's still reasonably priced. So I'm going to ask, well, Joe, I assume there's financing on the property. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Uh, maybe how much is currently owed on the loan? Now, if I'm asking, if, if Joe asked me why I need this information, I'm going to just say, well, Joe, we have several ways we can buy. And knowing the financing that's in place will let us formulate the best possible offer. Now, of course, if he refuses to tell me, we'll stop right there because I really can't make him any kind of offer if I don't know about the underlying financing. Uh, but if he shares the information, then I'm going to continue asking questions. Uh, and that monthly payment is, and does that amount include taxes and insurance? And how about the interest rate? Uh, is it a fixed rate? 
Is that on a 30-year note? Do you remember the year that it was originated? Now, of course, if he cuts me off at any time or refuses to answer these questions, I'll just state again that I really need the information to make him an offer. Uh, and, you know, you may hear something from time to time like, well, I need all cash, so what does that matter? And to that, I would say, well, Joe, there are many ways to sell. If we can get your house sold right away, like you say you need to do, aren't you open to hearing some other ways of getting it done? Again, if he's not open to listening, uh, then, you know, we may just cut the call short. If he's open to hearing some other things, you know, then we'll proceed. So after gathering the information, it appears that Joe owes $169,000 on his house. Now, the loan does have favorable terms, and it would allow for a nice cash flow. He's listing it himself because he just frankly doesn't have the equity to pay a realtor. And for buyer concessions and, and at top market value, he would most likely wind up having to bring a check to closing. So when I've got that information, that's when I'm going to make the pitch. I'm going to say, well, Joe, I'm sure you're aware that there isn't much equity here to work with, and we do expect to make a profit. Uh, you certainly owe more than I could make a cash offer for. However, we do have a program that might work for your property if it qualifies. If we could make the payments on your house until we could find a buyer who could get new financing, do you think that might work for you? Now, if he says yes or maybe or tell me more, you know, you can be pretty certain at that point that, that your deal is about 90% closed. You know, we talk about it. I explain that we'll take over the mortgage payments and we'll make that payment for them every month until we can find a buyer who can get new financing. Now, I answer every objection with honest, just no beating around the bush answers. And by the end of the call, I can usually get a yes if we've gotten that far along. Uh, yes, hey, I think that might work for us, and that's what I'm looking for. Now, this is how I do it and the thought that goes in behind it. It isn't particularly fancy or highly technical, and learning to read the signs along the way is really 99% of it. You know, there are a thousand ways to handle a seller on the phone, and I'm not saying mine is the only one that's right but it does work for me. So hope this helps you in getting out there and getting on the phone with some sellers. Uh, you know, it's not that difficult to do. After a while, you'll get used to it and, and you'll get in the groove. Personally, you know, those guys that, that hammer on the phone for hours every day, I don't know how they do it. I limit myself to five, ten calls a day. That's about it. And if you do that every day of the week for a month, it's pretty good. To, you know, it's just a pretty sure thing that you're going to get a deal if you're calling that many people and you're talking to them. And you know, think about the message. A lot of times you'll get voicemail messages. Uh, we've got uh, an article actually at sub2deals.com about uh, a specific voicemail message that we leave when we get those. And check that out over there. Why I love to get a seller's voicemail. But that's it for this episode of the Sub 2 Deal Show podcast. Uh, you can find the show notes for this episode along with a complete transcript at sub2podcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love it if you would subscribe and maybe even give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It only takes a minute, and it helps others discover the show. You can subscribe as well as leave a rating and review by visiting Apple Podcasts and just do a quick search for the Sub 2 Deal Show. It would also be great if you would consider sharing our podcast with a fellow real estate investor who you think might benefit from it. And finally, if you haven't yet, you can join our free Facebook Subject 2 group at sub2forum.com. That's S-U-B, the number 2, forum.com. You can also find lots of resources to help you grow your real estate investing business at sub2deals.com. So until next time, keep learning, keep talking to sellers, and you will get out there and buy some houses. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Sub 2 Deal Show with William Tingle. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And for more great content and to stay up to date, visit sub2deals.com and on Facebook at Sub 2 Deals. We'll catch you next time.